Hello, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Ransomware, Staying Ahead of a Fast-Evolving Threat. I'm Amber Noble, a Marketing Specialist at Barracuda MSP, and I'm happy to be moderating today's session. Today, I'm joined by Mark Balagier, a Systems Engineer here at Barracuda MSP. With more than 10 years' experience in the IT field, he possesses incredible insight into both the hardware and software side of the business. During today's educational webinar, Mark will walk us through the latest on ransomware, how it's surging undetected past traditional gateways, and what steps you can take to build and implement new strategies for your customers' protection. Before we get started, some brief housekeeping. During the webinar, if you have any questions, feel free to share them using the questions or chat panels to the right of the Zoom webinar screen. At the conclusion of the webinar, you'll be prompted to complete a brief polling survey. Please take a moment to tell us what you think so we can continually improve the content and quality of our online events. Now, without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Mark to begin today's presentation. Take it away, Mark. So first off, let's just talk about what ransomware is. Ransomware is a type of malware that criminals use to infiltrate your environment, often through an email, and encrypt the data on the systems. And they try to do it with as many vectors as possible. They'll send a message that the data will only be accessible if you pay a ransom, and often require that payment to be in cryptocurrency. The ransom can be in the thousands, but even if you pay, there's really no guarantee that your data will be unlocked. There's been a recent surge, actually, in the number of ransomware attacks, especially in the public sector, indicating that cities have been attacked uh, Baltimore and Atlanta come to mind, as well as small and medium businesses. There have been over 22 attacks so far this year in U.S. cities alone. So who is the target? Really, it's those that don't have the resources and will just pay the ransom. Uh, as I mentioned before, Baltimore, the city, was paralyzed uh, with people unable to buy or sell real estate uh, or pay their water bill. Then their email was also affected. The ransom, what they laid out was $76,000 and the city didn't want to pay, so now they're having to deal with doing things uh, with paper and pen. As we can see here, ransomware attacks have almost doubled year over year. So hackers have really renewed their ransomware attacks on businesses and organizations. Uh, these uh, organizations have detected a 500% increase uh, in malware over the past year, uh, as well as cities being on the rise. As I mentioned before, uh, 22 known public sector attacks uh, so far in 2019, which puts us on pace uh, to be greater than 2018. So we're just seeing the continuation uh, of these attacks growing. So now let's talk about the cost of ransomware. Uh, and it's not just causing grief for a specific uh, vertical or, or cities or, or anything like that. Uh, it's causing grief for everyone because it's quite lucrative for the people uh, making the attacks. Uh, they're estimating that the code uh, in ransomware has produced the equivalent to $3.7 million in Bitcoin since August. Uh, this is among 52 payments that they counted. The key is that uh, the attackers are willing to be patient and focus on the targets uh, that they find uh, really, really Im important. So ransomware have, have varied uh, in size. The highest uh, ransomware uh, was for $8.5 million or 3,000 Bitcoin. Uh, the highest actually paid uh, was nearly a million dollars at 935000 So just to put this in perspective, uh, I want to talk a little bit um, about a case study uh, with Atlas Research. Um, a gentleman, uh, Nels Benson, uh, who was hired as the director of Atlas Research, uh, has a pretty interesting story about this. So uh, Nels had been in IT for nearly 30 years and thought he had seen it all. Uh, that's basically right until he was accepting a director position uh, with Atlas. So uh, he is quoted as saying, while I was interviewing for the job, the company was exposed to a nasty ransomware attack after a senior executive clicked on a legitimate looking uh, email, what appeared to be from a partner firm. Because of this, uh, Benson's onboarding was delayed for three weeks as the company struggled through the attack with little or no preemptive help. The problem was supposedly taken care of before he was officially hired, but after he was hired and finally brought on, he couldn't get a straight answer as to uh, what the state of the company's backup technology was. Everyone simply said it's in the cloud. Uh, with no other specifics. Uh, he could tell they weren't really sure, uh, so he did some digging around and discovered that actually only a couple minimal backups were done on things like Dropbox and SharePoint. So uh, having his experience in, in working uh, with Barracuda and being certified on firewalls, load balancers, backups, and web filters in the past, 
Uh, he really prioritized his budget to get approval to purchase an on-premise Barracuda backup uh, of the 490 variety, uh, in addition to some other uh, cloud backups. So they brought in a contractor who'd been a colleague of his who had now who has uh, since joined Atlas, uh, and then they went ahead with the installation and configuration. Luckily, they did because the second attack came. Uh, so after this supposed cleanup of the first attack, a different employee had inadvertently clicked on this still compromised but dormant ransomware on a Dropbox file. Uh, basically, just working from an older device, it hadn't been cleaned up, uh, and they clicked on it. So immediately, they started noticing erratic behavior. Uh, they quickly severed the Dropbox connection, uh, severed the workstation connection, so tried to uh, mitigate uh, some of the damage as soon as they could. But even by the time they had done that, the ransomware had already infected 75% of the company data. So obviously better than the 100% from that initial attack, uh, but really still preventing employees from getting their work done. So the first attack without the Barracuda backup had taken three weeks to fix and still didn't clean everything uh, as they found out. Uh, so in his estimation, that cost over a million dollars in lost productivity. Uh, with the Barracuda installed and configured before the second attack, the total downtime was just four hours, uh, or basically $30,000 in lost productivity compared to a million. Uh, so after logging into the backup portal, they were able to restore the files in half a day, uh, really um, something that, that was surprising to senior leadership uh, and they were very happy about. So in the end, uh, Atlas Research ultimately saw a happy ending after those two separate uh, but related ransomware attacks, uh, but it was a very difficult learning experience for the company. Uh, most of all, he's, uh, Benson was just glad to see uh, things get recovered and he was really happy um, with the peace of mind that Barracuda provide. So uh, he, he said he, he's quoted as saying he can go on and on, uh, but uh, something nice about Barracuda is that uh, you know we're, we're always going to be there to help you. Um, we're never going to ask you for a credit card if you're calling support. The first thing we want to do is make sure uh, that we take care of you, um, and so we're going to we're going to make sure that that backup is in place to get you back up and running, uh, so you can ho hopefully have this quick recovery um, because of an attack. So now let's talk about who is the target. So most of the studies have found that uh, the real attacks are on small business, roughly 71%. Uh, the average demand is uh, $116,000 uh, with a median of $10,000 uh, and about 3,300 incidents uh, of, uh, involving ransomware in 2018. So uh, small to medium business were the most sought after because they are usually the ones that are going to spend a lot less on securing their computing systems uh, than a larger firm. Um, so it's going to make it a lot easier for that malicious uh, software or email uh, to get in and compromise their systems. Um, they're also discovering that attackers of all skill levels are, levels are involved. So there's things out there such as ransomware as a service. Uh, basically, uh, people can take pre-written software to go ahead and, and run it and attack whoever they like, um, as well as highly skilled um, attackers who use ransomware to attack specific targets uh, with goals even beyond extortion. So besides um, abusing uh, weekly protected domains, uh, attackers also used uh, sextortion campaigns, basically duping the victims into downloading ransomware malware uh, by saying that they had information uh, about webcam activity or internet browsing um, and trying to get them to, to click this information uh, when in fact it was malware that was designed to steal information and install ransomware. So the, the key here is to understand is that no one is immune uh, anyone who attackers find out is going to be vulnerable uh, will continue to be attacked. And the scary thing about this is that this is probably just the tip of the iceberg. Um, most often, uh, people don't want to report this because it can be embarrassing to themselves personally or to their organization. So uh, these are just the ones that have been reported. Um, so they believe that it's going to be actually a, quite a bit more that's actually going on. So now let's talk about how a ransomware attack works. So the first step to understanding, or to bridging this, is to understanding uh, all the ways that these things can happen. So we'll talk about the process first, and, and we'll step through this chart. Uh, it starts off with reconnaissance. Uh, an attacker is going to understand uh, that with social media, um, people are posting things, usually with little, no regard how that information can be used against them. So you can go into LinkedIn and find out who the director of IT is for a specific company. As an attacker, at that point in time, I can begin to send emails to people inside that organization pretending to be that IT director. Uh, once someone clicks a link, it might not seem like anything happened, uh, but in fact, malware is being installed on in the background on the victim's computer. 
And then once inside, I can set up a VPN tunnel uh, from that system uh, to wherever my uh, my den is or, or my home base or wherever my operations are uh, to evade any firewall defensives uh, on the outbound side. And so these days, attackers aren't going to try to break through a firewall really because it's just too difficult. So they lie on social engineering and other ways to evade it. Another form of attack is called the drive-by download. Uh, what this is, is basically uh, the attacker doesn't need you to click on a link or download anything. The file is loaded automatically uh, by visiting a simple site. And so these attacks usually exploit a vulnerability in the browsers uh, or a Java plugin. Uh, so once installed, the malicious code proceeds to download something uh, like a remote access Trojan that's going to give the attacker remote access to the victim's computer. And then from there, they can gather passwords and gain uh, additional knowledge uh, and move laterally inside the infrastructure. Um, so how we want to go ahead and, and prevent this from uh, happening is you want to make sure that employees are keeping their web browsers uh, and keep programs updated with the latest patches. Also, you want to be running script blocking programs, so like ad block uh, or no script, things of that nature, or script safe, uh, basically blocking pop-ups and malicious scripts. Another good practice is to segment the computer network so that everyone isn't running off the same server, so you can prevent uh, infection from spreading throughout the office. Uh, don't allow employees to have local administrative access. Uh, instead, set them up with a separate account. Again, good tool for isolation. And then, of course, you want to back up the data as frequently as possible, now, making sure that all that information is going to be stored safely somewhere. So if something does happen, there's a recent backup that's going to allow people to get their information quickly. And then, of course, uh, run an antivirus or malware detection consistently on machines. Uh, so lots of ways to try to mitigate this. Uh, but again, I think the key one here is you want to make sure that information is backed up. So if someone does accidentally click a link or compromise a machine, it's been segmented so that they can uh, be isolated quickly and then uh, provided uh, a recent backup so they don't lose a lot of their data. Another way uh, that attackers can get in is through a web application. So if you're an organization uh, that's hosting a website on the internet, uh, there's plenty of ways that attackers can go in uh, and try to compromise that server behind it and possibly get information. So uh, these can be broken down into a handful of common attacks. Uh, Cross-site scripting uh, is about 40% of the uh, attempts uh, last year. Uh, really what's going on there is that uh, the attacker is trying to upload a malicious script uh, because the site had uh, improperly been sanitized, uh, such as allowing multiple user inputs um, or, or anything like that. And so uh, their, their browsers are going to, uh, if another person visits that site after this uh, uh, script has been loaded, um, they can be infected and their browser can execute the malicious code and infect that victim. So they're not uh, usually very sophisticated. Um, there's a lot of kind of preset tools um, called script kitties. Uh, basically allowing inexperienced people to use scripts that have already been created uh, to try to go ahead and infect websites. Uh, SQ SQL injection uh, makes up about 24% of the attacks. Uh, really, that occurs uh, when the attacker is trying to enter malicious uh, SQL code into a field on a web page so that the server responds uh, with some sort of uh, sensitive data or information that it can reveal to the attacker. Um, Path traversal, a lot less common, only about 7%. Uh, basically, just trying to uh, access unauthorized files or directories outside the web root folder by injecting different patterns and, and black slashes uh, above the, the service directory to see if they can successfully get uh, somewhere in the hierarchy that maybe they shouldn't. So uh, how do we protect from this? So there's, there's a couple ways to do it. And again, this is all protecting that web application uh, that's public facing. You want to continue uh, vulnerability scanning and security testing, making sure that all the server patchings have been up to date uh, to protect that from any known vulnerabilities uh, that have been out there. Uh, really key is to install a web application firewall. Uh, that's going to provide a very important line of defense uh, between uh, kind of the outside world and any potential attackers and your servers. Um, servers, unfortunately, are, are very friendly and want to help everybody out. And so they're going to respond to all their requests, uh, especially uh, ones from the hacker, hackers and attackers, uh, just because they don't know any better. They're just trying to, to do their job. Whereas a web application firewall is going to be able to mitigate uh, whether or not this is a legitimate request or is this someone trying to attack. And then, of course, uh, train the, the developers. Make sure that developers understand uh, any vulnerabilities or uh, 
places in, in the website that, that could be vulnerable to an attack uh, and be sure that they are, are secured up and, and so that that software itself um, that's deployed online is going to be secure. So ultimately, the attacker is going to try to get identity, credentials, and data. And so once they do that, they're going to try to move laterally. So once they're inside, they're going to, with one person or one server, they're going to try to spread um, their hooks into everything and get uh, connections to as many things as possible that might let them install malware. So once they get that connection and the malware is installed, then they're going to try to to cover their tracks. They're going to try to stay in as long as possible, get as much information as they can, uh, and, and try to spread out through the entire organization to understand what the most valuable pieces of information uh, are going to be. And then at that point, uh, it's kind of up to them. So they can uh, uh, damage your information, they can steal it, they can encrypt it. Um, they, you know, one thing they could do is um, deface the web application. So um, if you've ever seen a website that has funny pictures of dinosaurs on it or something like that, it's a good chance they've been hacked and defaced. Um, if that's the only thing that happens to you while your uh, uh, server has been compromised, consider yourself very, very lucky. Um, but unfortunately, that's usually not the case. So after this is all done, they're just going to pull out all the data that they can uh, and then sell it or, or do whatever they want to do with it. They're, they're essentially off to the races. So they're pulling that data from your network to their network, and then they're, they're on their way. So another thing to think about is software as a service. So now we're moving things to the clouds, like O3C5 and Exchange. Um, so the idea here is that um, now that data is no longer stored at your headquarters. That's now stored in the cloud. Uh, but it's really important to remember that the cloud providers are responsible for security of the cloud. So they care about the infrastructure but they don't necessarily about, care about your data and who has access to it. So it's also important to install those same security member, measures uh, in your cloud, things like firewalls, uh, just to make sure that only the right people are, are getting access to that information. Otherwise, an attacker could go in and possibly infect that, and you'd have the same problems with that data coming out. So let's talk about what your options are. So if you get infected, you can pay the ransom. Pros to that, uh, less expensive than trying to uh, restore those files from scratch or basically rebuild everything. Uh, and the criminals generally do give a key that works to encrypt the files. Um, pretty high percentage uh, success rate with paying that uh, encryption uh, for that encryption key. Paying the ransom cons, again, there's no guarantee that they will unlock the files. Um, it's going to encourage the attackers because they're successful. They got paid. They're going to keep doing it. Uh, and then the other thing is that uh, I kind of alluded to before is that they've probably already been in there a while. So uh, there's a good chance that they might find some other vulnerability that they can charge you for again later. So now let's talk about not paying the ransom. So this is the best practice from the FBI because if you do pay, you're only adding to the problem. But unfortunately, this is really only an option if you have a backup that you can recover from. Because if not, if your information is encrypted, encrypted um, you're, you're really out of luck. So don't pay the ransom cons. Uh, basically, you're, you're, you're still gonna have to clean up a little bit um, even if you do have a good backup, uh, but you see the cities we talked about earlier, um, you know, they're, they're saying it's now costing them between 10 and $17 million. So that's a pretty hefty price tag for an initial ransom fee that they said was uh, in the 70,000s. Um, that's now uh, become enormous. So really the ideal scenario, don't get infected in the first place. So that's, that's a dream. Um, it, Unfortunately, in this day and age, uh, everyone's being attacked. Uh, it's, it's not really an, an if, it's a when and, and how bad. Um, so you, you just want to do your best uh, to have a plan to recover uh, and to be able to protect yourself and isolate um, the situation as, as best you can. So what we can do, you want to reduce uh, risk from your email threats 
So things you can do here, protect against spear phishing, um, you know, tools that offer artificial intelligence uh, to weed out uh, suspicious emails, even emails without a payload. Uh, use multi-factor authentication, uh, something you have and something you know, uh, to make sure that only legitimate users get access. And then, of course, train people about phishing emails and making sure that they're checking for the right things to make sure that, uh, that email is from a legitimate source. And then, of course, you kind of want to assess your network uh, and your equipment to make sure uh, that you understand where you are now and you know, maybe some things you need to improve on uh, and what should deserve uh, the highest priority first. Reducing risk from drive-by downloads. Uh, obviously, you want firewalls in place, making sure that they're scanning any traffic into and out of the network to provide that protection. You want to protect all of your endpoints uh, with malware software, uh, anti-malware software and antivirus. Uh, and again, make sure everything is kept up to date with the latest patches uh, for all of your um, software and plugins. And then, of course, be careful who you give access to and make sure that that's being tracked and audited uh, so you can understand if uh, some erratic behavior is going on. Um, see what credentials have been compromised, so you can go ahead and remediate that. Another thing to think about uh, is taking out a cyber insurance policy um, to cover any type of losses uh, if these attacks do happen. Uh, and again, segmentation is key here, so uh, maybe make sure that all of your, your banking is only done on a specific computer um, that is isolated a little bit from the network or on a separate network, so it's not easy to get to. Um, make sure everything's backed up. Um, again, uh, lots, lots of ways to, to stay, um, keep specific things isolated and difficult to, to pr have access to, uh, as well as um, making sure that you can quickly recover um, by having everything uh, properly patched and backed up. So how you would recover, make that plan. So again, backups are, are going to be the most important. So uh, if you have nothing else, um, would never recommend it if you've got no firewall, no endpoint security, no antivirus, uh, but you do have a backup that, that runs every hour. Um, you're probably going to have to do it a lot, but you'll still be able to recover those backups. Um, so again, it's a multi-layered approach, but uh, backup's going to be key to avoid paying that ransom because you're going to have a form of your information that's not encrypted uh, that they can't charge you for. Uh, and then again, you see this third bullet point, uh, save enough historical data to have a good recovery point. You want to make sure that that backup is pretty consistent. So maybe that doesn't need to be every day for everyone. Uh, but make sure that those, you know, maybe the research and development team uh, is, is business critical. So you want to make sure that that's backed up every couple hours. Um, maybe some administrators, uh, emails, yeah, less important, back them up uh, once every couple days. Um, but just make sure that you have a plan uh, to make sure you can have everything recovered quickly and easily. So five ways to stay safe. Perform that ransomware audit like we talked about before. Make sure. Uh, you know uh, where your strengths and weaknesses are currently and what you're going to need to work on and what's going to be a top priority. Um, you also want to understand that uh, everyone is vulnerable. Uh, attackers aren't just targeting you know, those larger companies. They're attacking anyone who they think is going to have weak security. Number two, secure all threat vectors and attack services. Uh, this is that multi-layered approach we were talking about. So making sure that uh, the, the six main attack vectors are covered. Are covered. That's email, web applications, remote users, on-site users, uh, the network perimeter, and remote access. So you want to make sure that a firewall is, is handling a lot of that, but it's not going to be enough by itself. There are some things that you need to, to kind of overlap and complement uh, the security that's offered by a firewall. Uh, educate your users. So deploy some uh, security awareness training, making sure that users are understanding what a, a phishing email looks like, how they can check for legitimacy, uh, and to always um, pick up the phone or, or send an email to support uh, to let them know that you know, this looks suspicious and they can flag it to make sure that no one else is going to get that email as well. Keep everything updated. Like I've said multiple times before, you've got to make sure that uh, everything is patched and, and up to date. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the, the bigger uh, name ransomware attacks that have been successful are because large organizations just didn't have the time to deploy a patch after it was released, um, and attackers took advantage of that. And of course, use a good backup solution. Make sure that it's going to be reliable and test that backup solution. So um, get it installed, back some things up, try to restore from it so you know it all works, you know how it works, and then you can recover quickly 
uh, in the event that something bad does happen. So choose your partner wisely. Um, Barracuda was actually recently named uh, Ransomware Protection Company of the Year in 2019 by Storage Awards. So we're going to uh, help you out with um, detecting the ransomware and advanced threats. Uh, we can provide a multi-layer um, detection technologies, including sandboxing technologies, uh, really just making sure that uh, you know nothing is getting onto your network that you're not aware of its behavior. So uh, we talk about this multi-layered uh, defense idea and, and the, the key concepts here. Um, you want to make sure that, that these bases are all covered. Essentially, your email is protected. Your, your web applications are protected, so those public-facing um, internet websites for e-commerce. Your network perimeter is protected, so nothing coming into your network um, is, is being allowed in if you're not aware of its behavior. So all that malware is being vetted and scanned and blocked. So even if it's a brand new attack, uh, you're going to know that, hey, this is actually a malicious file. We're not going to let it in. And then, of course, your data protection. That's your backup to make sure that uh, you can recover anything, even if someone does pull the USB in off the street and plug it into a computer in the network and it affects everyone. Unfortunately, there's not a lot you can do about that, uh, except recover quickly if you've got a good backup solution in place. And the final piece is a remote monitoring and management tool. Uh, this is going to really help uh, with patch management, being able to ensure that all of your devices are updated with the latest patches and firmware, uh, and then automate a lot of these processes uh, whenever possible. So again, the key is that uh, multi-layered defense and overlapping protection. So we've got a bunch of products here, like I just mentioned. Um, Fishline, Sentinel, the Email Security Service, the Cloud Archiving Service, the Barracuda Content Shield, the Firewall, the Web Application Firewall, uh, Backup and Intronus Backup, and Cloud to Cloud Backup. So a lot of different flavors, uh, depending on your organizational needs, uh, but uh, plenty of ways to uh, provide you protection there and manage workplace acting as that RMM. So what we're really about is giving MSPs the path to grow. Uh, against the threat of ransomware, or really whatever else is going to come your way. So we're going to give you the tools to drive success through a focused portfolio, uh, create uh, comprehensive service offerings, and then deliver uh, easily and profitably robust, scalable services powered by our purpose-built platform. And from there, you can demonstrate the unique value with built-in reporting, threat and activity levels. We make it easy for you as an MSP to show the value you provide to each customer. So the next steps to learn more, uh, barracudamsp.com slash ransomware. And also, I highly recommend everyone sign up for a free O365 email threat scanner. It'll go through, scan your mailboxes, uh, and check for any uh, threats that are sitting in those mailboxes that have been known, and then we can help uh, pull them out for you. And again, more information, always feel free to email sales or uh, barracudamsp.com. And thank you very much. Excellent, Mark. I'm just going to go ahead and launch that poll I mentioned back at the beginning. If everyone could just take a minute and answer it for us, give us some feedback, that'd be great. And in the meantime, uh, if you have any questions from Mark, go ahead and throw them in the questions or chat panels, and we'll get to them in just a moment. Okay, Mark, we do have some questions starting to come in. Uh, Tim asks, is there a demo of Fishline available somewhere? Uh, I believe uh, the sales reps do have um, a video demo that they can show you. Uh, if you contact your local representative, um, they'd be able to, to deliver that to you um, and talk about Fishline. Yes. And I believe uh, we also have more extensive details on the, um, the Fishline product on the website as well. Yep, absolutely, barracudamsp.com, um, data sheets and more information there. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, we'll just hold on one more minute. If anyone else has some questions, go ahead and throw them in the questions or chat panel. Okay, Mark, we have another question uh, from Andy. He asks, what is the best way to backup to avoid the backup itself being infected by ransomware? Um, yeah, so you just, you just wanna make sure you have segmentation and really um, limit uh, who's gonna have access to that. So uh, basically keeping it separate um, and hide those credentials. A uh, good solution, um, keep it in the cloud. Uh, Again, if, if you're some regulations force you to keep it on premises, but um, we found that keeping it in the cloud is really nice because um, if you do it through Barracuda, uh, we have it secured in multiple locations for for disaster recovery. So um, you're, you're always going to have a good copy of it, uh, and then just limit those credentials of whoever can have access to it. Um, so we're going to have point in time recovery. Um, so if something happened on today, um, you can go back to yesterday and, and restore from whenever that last backup was. Um, or even earlier today. Uh, but yeah, segmentation is gonna be the key there. Okay, we have another question. Uh, do you have a scanner to check the backups for malware so as to not restore malware by accident? Um, not, not with the backups. Uh, you just wanna make sure that you do, do that scan um, before um, you, you backup anything. So you wanna scan all of your information um, before you go ahead and do the backup. Um, to pull it off. Again, it's point in time recovery. So if you did have backups in the past and then wanted to uh, um, and and then scan and found something, you could just make a note to, you know, only scan after this, only recover from after this date, which w is what you would want to do. Uh, but the key there would be to um, scan that before uh, before you, you backed it all up. Um, again, it's all it's it's all capabilities for point in time. So even if you did find something later on, um, and then that, that latest backup would have that malware removed. Um, so you're gonna be fine to go ahead and restore from that latest backup, so. Okay, we have a question specifically about the different uh, backup solutions we offer. What's the difference between Intronus and Barracuda backup? And which would be better oh. for preventing against ransomware? Um, the different, all the different backup solutions, uh, they all, they all fundamentally do the same thing, so there's not one that's gonna be better at preventing ransomware than another. Um, it's just how they're hosted, whether they're um, physical, virtual, or in the cloud, um, just really where they're located um, and provides you with the flexibility uh, to deploy as you need. Okay, we have another question. Does the Barracuda, do Barracuda products uh, protect against file list ransomware infections, or do we need to rely purely on backups after infection? On, the, said file list? File list, yes. Um, well, I'm not sure if I totally in, understand. So, um, it wouldn't really be a ransomware infection because ransomware itself is going to be a, a file. It's going to be something that's um, installed. Um, I think um, you might be referring to like a spear phishing attack that doesn't have a payload. So you'll get an a email um, that doesn't say download this file or, or click this link. Um, that, that we do have protection for. It's a product called Sentinel. Um, it uses artificial intelligence uh, to monitor for anomalies of spoofed emails so that if someone says, uh, sends an email saying, hey, I'm the president of the company uh, to person in accounts payable. Um, you need to wire uh, this money to, to this account. Um, you know, thanks a bunch. Great to see you last weekend at the golf tournament, signed the, the president. Uh, there was no payload on that. There was no file in that. Uh, but maybe that's not the way that the CEO sends in, uh, signs off their, or the president signs off their email or that's not the time of day they sign off their email, or more importantly, that's probably not the email account that they used to send email. So we can prevent that from happening so those spoofed emails don't get through uh, to prevent that um, unauthorized transfer.
Okay, excellent. I am seeing a few other questions, but they're more very specific situations, and uh, I'd rather have Mark or one of our sales guys follow up with somebody directly um, for these very specific situations. So I do see your questions, and we will follow up on those. Um, if there's any more generic questions, uh, go ahead and send them in. Otherwise, we'll, we'll wrap this up in just a minute. All right, I'm not seeing any more questions coming in. Thank you again uh, so much for joining us today. Thank you, Mark. Uh, pleasure as always to hear you uh, explain everything. Um, I definitely took some things away from today. I hope uh, the rest of our audience did. And uh, thank you.